And there we go. Well, yeah, welcome everyone. Thanks Marcus for starting us off. Um, this is your CPO7 meeting for the night. So we'll roll right into things here. We've got a, a main topic on Springville Road and the, the widening project and a very interesting section there. So welcome your comments and questions a little bit later on. And um, yeah, let's, let's, let's start off here. So with uh, announcements in general, we'll start with the Sheriff's Office. Roll into it, anything for us? Thanks, Andrew. This is Brenda Schaefer. I am your community outreach person for the whole wide Bethany area at large there. And uh, well, I just wanted to remind you all, we've got some rough weather coming through. And that is the reason we don't have a deputy on this meeting this evening, because they are very busy tending to troubles on the roadways. Um, for each one of you, make sure you're looking after your car. Uh, keep your air pressure in your tires where it should be. Uh, it's a good time if you need new wiper blades, get them on there. And it's also a really good time to observe street signals, those stop signs, observe the speed limits. And if you see high water, don't take it as a challenge, avoid it. It'll get you in trouble as some folks apparently are in trouble this evening. Beyond that, um, yeah, Bethany is seeing some trouble and I'm gonna go ahead if I may and share my screen. To, to give you a look at what our calls for service map looks like lately. Hopefully that is adequately showing to all of you. Um, you see there's smattering events around. We are experiencing some package thefts. Everybody knows you're ordering neat things for the holidays. So do your best, keep track of when those ship, uh, packages are coming in and collect them as soon as you can. Maybe you and the neighbors work together and look after each other packages. Um, if you have a package disappear, please do report it to us. Now, you probably are noticing it after the fact. It's not too often people see someone actively running away from the door. If they were actively running away, that's a 911 call. But most of these calls will be non-emergency. In Washington County at the Sheriff's Office, yes, we take those non-emergency calls very seriously. We tend to them. And it's those reports coming in that sometimes will get you reunited with your stolen packages. They're not always gone for good. We do recover a fair number of goods, but it's also, it's hard to charge somebody with theft if nobody says anything was ever stolen. So the reporting is so extremely important. And you know, my holiday wish for you is that you don't have to worry about this, that you don't experience any of this. But um, that's something we're keeping an eye on. We're seeing, it's really important to lock up your cars, lock up those doors this time of year. Uh, every evening, all times of year, but especially now we're seeing more car thefts. We are seeing uh, cars being prowled and rummaged through. People are looking for expensive items left behind in your car. And uh, your idea what is expensive and their idea may be different things. They might end up stealing a duffel bag with your old gym socks in it. They didn't know before they broke in that it could have been something valuable in there. So just take things out of, don't leave valuable items in your car and lock them up. So those are my tips for you this evening. And uh, I wish you all just the most warm and wonderful holiday and all of us at the Sheriff's Office do too. So with that, that's all I have to report. Thanks, Brenda. Any questions, raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll roll on. I see one. Jeff. Yes, hi, Brenda. Uh, I was reading some stuff on um, Nextdoor about, as well as just parents talking about it, some instances with students over in the Bethany Shopping Center. And, and um, do you have any more information on what that or what's happened or what the incidents were or what I, the, uh, what I can, I can, I can acquire some more specifics for you. Uh, I can't immediately speak to specifics. I do know we've had a number of interesting situations of uh, students communicating on social media, maybe planning things that might not be positive events. We've been proactive and we've been working with the schools and our school resource officers, our active liaisons, um, 
Definitely. As, as parents out there, if, if you catch on or hear of things that don't sound right, talk to us about it. Um, we, we really find information useful. And most situations do not material, materialize because we work proactively, as I said, with the schools, with the school resource officers. And um, there may just happen to be a few extra deputies hanging around at a location that was reported to be a place they were all gonna show up. And often that's what it takes to cause things not to escalate. But uh, I, Jeff, I, I'll be happy to look up more specifics well, for you. That's all right. I just wanted to, um, it's not necessary, I, but I, I knew there was something going on. And since there's not a deputy available uh, to speak to it, um, the sheriff's department's aware of it. I think the key is um, uh, the school has been identified, the schools have been identified, or I should say, uh, been working with the schools. And that's, uh, um, I think that's a key way to address it. So. Yes, yes. And I'll also add uh, with what you're saying, you know, we have no ability to monitor conversations on Nextdoor. That is a social media platform that was set up to protect and preserve privacy of anyone who's on there using it. So there's no agency. You can complain about LUT all you want or about the sheriff's office or anyone all you want on Nextdoor. We cannot see those conversations. We can post out informational messages to you and we can see your direct replies on those comments back to us, but that's all we can see. Oh, well, thank you for that tip. So, yeah. Mary. Um, I heard today there was a bad accident on the corner of um, West Union and Bethany Boulevard to the point where the intersection was actually closed down. Mm -hmm. um, any information on that other than there was an accident and closed the intersection. Once again, I can get you more information. I do not have it right now. Um, again, it, you know, by the time you get the information to us, it, it will be gone. Um, I will say it's not maintained by us, but on Facebook, there is someone who goes by uh, the Washco scanner moniker. And this is a private individual that does a remarkably good job at following scanners. So you may actually see some information if you were to pop over to Facebook and look for the Washco scanner. Um, that was actually where, where I saw it, oh. not Washco scanner, but I think Virginia Bruce picked it up in Cedar Mill News. And okay. Just hadn't seen anything more from it. And I'm assuming at you this know, point that the intersection is back open again. Okay, in the course of our meeting tonight, I will try to have a side conversation and maybe be able to put something into the comments for you before okay. the meeting okay. ends. Great. I Thank will do you. my best. Anything else? Okay. Uh, let's see, we've got one, one more and then we'll wrap up here. Susan. Yes, Susan. Hi. Uh... Is there any place where one can see what the statistics are on the incidence of accidents at a particular location? That it would not be something that the sheriff's office maintains. If it exists, um, that may be a DOT resource, an ODOT. Um, once again, let me see what I can find out for you, Susan. Brenda, I could probably help you out if you can hear me. Oh, fantastic. Lieutenant the Rollinson. Computer's terrible with the audio, so I apologize if you can't hear me very well. We do track where accidents are occurring. We have kind of a database. So we give those extra patrol. Um, I can't tell you what happened at Bethany and West Union whenever that crash was. I didn't hear about it today. We have crashes every day, right? Especially as the weather goes sideways like it's about to. And so we do try to track for trends for doing extra enforcement and things like that. And uh, if you email our traffic team, their information's on the website. They might be able to share some of that with you if you're really interested in it. Um, just go to the Sheriff's Office website. I think Brenda probably shared that with you. And there's one for the traffic team and uh, an email for traffic complaints. And you could email our traffic sergeant. He could look into it. Um, but we do, we do kind of keep track of that. 
um, just so we can adjust our patrols to try to be where the crashes are happening. Hopefully that answers your question, but I can't tell you what happened today. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not so much interested in what happened today as I am interested in the overall picture of, um, of that particular intersection with regards to land use planning decisions and um, um, changing yeah. traffic patterns. Yeah, I'm not sure the answer to that question. I will tell you this, um, maybe Brenda and I can look in to see where the, the hot, hot spots are up there as far as where we're seeing a lot of crashes and we can give that to you next month. Uh, maybe the yeah, top So, so I'm, I'm particularly interested in the intersection at 85th and West Union. Yeah, we can see if that's on there. I don't, I don't think it's gonna be at the top, that's for sure, but uh, I don't know for sure where on our list it would be, but uh, we'll look into it. Okay, and again, the, the, the ranking is not necessarily the issue, but just specifically, I'd like to see what the stats are for that particular location. Yeah, that, that's fine. I think Brenda can get that to you and send it to you for sure from our traffic sergeant. All right, thank you. Do I need to give you any additional? <laughs> well, you'll need to connect with Brenda for uh, email and things like that so she can share it with you. That's, that's when, fine. when I logged in, sure. I gave my email address and uh, uh, okay. so that should be sufficient. Okay. Susan, you, uh, you cut out momentarily. It was the intersection of what and West Union? 185th. 185th. Okay. Yeah. And, and Lieutenant Rawlinson, while you're on here, did you have some um, comments you could share with Jeff regarding his question? Yeah, Were you... I heard it. I'm not familiar with exactly what he's talking about okay. either. It looks like the commissioner has her hand up too. So I don't know if that's for me while I'm here. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Actually, I, I was just going to bring everybody's attention to Sarah Beachy's comment in the uh, chat that Metro does keep uh, crash information or uh, on, and we can access that as well. So um, I think that I can work with um, uh, LUT and find out that way. Awesome. Like I said, we do kind of a hotspot mapping thing, but it's more for our internal use. We don't uh, publish that, but it's certainly probably, we could share it no problem it's just not something so, i have in front of me so i'm going to ask megan mckibben if she uh remind me to follow up on that and thanks sarah yeah good good information thank you very much all right i appreciate all your good efforts out there as the weather does go a little bit nuts so appreciate it um, let's see, THPRD, do we have any updates that you'd like to share with the CPO? Uh, two updates this evening. One is for the dog park at <laughs> I Commissioner Trees uh, at PCC Rock Creek. In the warmer months, we have the separate areas for small dogs and large dogs. Uh, but to do this, we have to change the ground cover for the area of the smaller dog run. Um, if we wanted to keep it around open all year, sorry, we'd have to change that to wood chips. Right now we close part it a bit off during the winter to give the grass a chance to um, recover. So we're going to have a survey out asking people whether they want to keep um, a grassy area or if we should wood chip it all and keep it all open year round. That's going to be available December 15th, so Wednesday through January 17th. And I, once I get the link for that survey, uh, I will send it over to the CPO for posting. And then the second thing we have is that Wednesday is also the last day of our gift giving job, uh, drive. We partner with the Beaverton School District to help families in need. So if you want to help spread some of the holiday joy that Brenda spoke about, uh, please drop by a gift card for any local merchant, grocery store, large retailer. No amount is too small. Um, suggested a maximum of $50 so that we can spread uh, the joy. And those can be dropped off at any of our open facilities. Uh, our campus here at 158th and Walker is open, or you can call 503-439-9400 to find an open facility near you.
All right. Janine, is is that information on the THPRD website as well? It is actually, it's right on the front page. One of the three things that scrolls through. Okay, great, thanks. Perfect, all right. Uh, any other general announcements before we roll into things? I see Mary with her hand up. Mary, you're muted. Ah, you did. Mary, you're muted. The Salzman Road Advisor Group meeting is um, coming up on this coming Thursday, 5 to 7 p.m. The Zoom link you can find on our Facebook page, um, as well as the county website if you if you use their search function and put in Salzman Road update, um, you can probably find it that way as well. So um, find out what's happening um, with an update on Salzman Road. Show up on Thursday for Zoom. Um, and then we also have, we sent a letter back in, our CPO sent a letter back in September, and we've been asked to make a couple of um, corrections and updates or clarifications. Um, and Andrew, I don't know if you want us to deal with that now or if we should wait until the end of the meeting to, to address that. You know, I, Mary, I'm going to jump in. You know, the, the Springville pe people really don't want to lose okay. your time tonight. Okay. Okay. So okay. Let's, let's, we'll take let's that business deal with it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder as well. All right. Any, I think that rounds out our announcements, unless anyone else has any statements they'd like to make very quickly. All right. Sounds good. On to Springville. Off we go. Okay, everybody hear me okay? Yep, we got you. Okay, um, I'm Andy Morris with uh, Washington County and the Capital Project Services Department. And I am the project manager for the Springville uh, phase four project. Uh, I will be the project manager through the design and the delivery portion. I'm going to screen share a presentation here. Get this to pop up. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, with this bike and pedestrian. PowerPoint presentation that walks us through uh, two proposed alternatives for, for Springville. Uh, this presentation is consistent with what will be going to the uh, Board of County Commissioners. Uh, once I get through this, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 slides, I'm going to pull up another one, uh, quick PowerPoint that shows a plan view with an aerial overlay. Uh, of what the road might look like uh, with the two alternatives shown at, at one time. Um, so yeah, if I can get through that uh, and save the questions for the end, I can jump back in and uh, catch anybody's questions or comments. Sorry, okay. So on this first slide here, we're looking at uh, the project location in the middle, which is uh, Springville phase four, which is from approximately the PCC entrance down to the Joss 165th intersection. And on the east side there, you will see the phase three project that just recently wrapped up. And on the west side, you will see the Springville phase one and two projects that were completed a couple of years ago. Okay, we can look at the traffic data for Springville. Uh, the average daily traffic uh, right now is around 7,300 vehicles. In 2035, we're expecting that to be over 10,000. Okay, so I have the project broken up into four different segments. Uh, in all cases, we will be looking, all the slides when we move forward after the aerials here, we will be looking east. Uh, segment one, 
starts just uh, east of the PCC entrance and runs down to the, the east limit of PCC. Segment two will pick up from that point, go across Samuel and past Samuel a couple of hundred feet. And then we, we jump into segment three which is the, the area over the big culvert uh, with the big wall on the north side. And segment four is from the east culvert up to just past the, the Joss 165th intersection. Okay, current conditions. Uh, so looking east here, this is the PCC intersection. We're looking at uh, a five lanes that tapers down into three immediately past the intersection. Uh, on the north side of the road here, we have a 10 foot shared use path and a seven foot buffered bike lane. On the south side, we have a, again, a seven foot buffered bike lane, a planter strip and a five foot walk. And this is the current conditions at the east end on the project that just wrapped up. On the north side, we're, we're looking at a five foot uh, sidewalk, a seven foot buffered bike lane on both sides of the road. And on the south side, there's a planter strip back to an existing five foot walk. So again, all, all of these, this is alternative one. All the slides we're looking at by segment, we're gonna be facing east. And if you hear me say curb tight walk throughout this, it's uh, curb tight walk means the walk is immediately at the back of curb. There is no planter strip. So an alternate one, segment one, uh, on the north side, we show a 10 foot shared use path that runs from the match point all the way down to the 173rd intersection. And then it actually narrows up from that, that point to an eight footer, which we will see on the, on the aerial. But anyways, 10 foot shared use path with a four foot planner, seven foot buffered bike lanes on both sides of the road. And on the south side, we're showing a four foot uh, landscape strip and a six foot walk. And then as we move down to the end of the PCC property, the shared use path would be reduced down to an eight foot sidewalk with seven foot bike lanes on both sides. And then a curb tight six foot sidewalk on the south side. Segment three, which is the east culvert crossing, we're carrying an eight foot sidewalk and seven foot buffered bike lanes on both sides of the road. On segment four, leaving the culvert and heading up to Joss, we're proposing utilizing the existing five foot curb tight sidewalk. Again, seven foot buffered bike lanes on both sides. And then a, a varying planner that uh, on, the, on the south side and then utilizing the six foot existing sidewalk. So that's alternate one. Alternate two is the same on the north side with a 10 foot shared use path and a seven foot bike lane. On the south side though, we're showing a 10 foot shared use path with a four foot lamp planter strip. And on segment two near Samuel, we're showing the same eight foot sidewalk on the north side, seven foot buffered bike lanes on either side of the road and a curb tight 10 foot shared use path on the south side. Then we get into segment three over the east culvert crossing. Nothing has changed from segment one or alternate, 
alternative one. We're showing an eight foot sidewalk on both sides, curved tight and seven foot buffered bike lanes. At segment four, we're showing again on the north side, utilizing the existing uh, five foot sidewalk, seven foot buffered bike lanes, and then we're back to a 10 foot shared use path. And we would remove all the existing walk on the south side. I think I should jump back to to segment three right here and point out that the, the center turn lane is has been removed in that section. And it's uh, we'll be able to see it better in a minute and it uh, on a plan view. Uh, it actually it narrows it narrows up coming off of Samuel and then white goes fully narrow across the culvert and then widens back out into the Joss intersection. So I'll run through the next steps real quick. Um, once we're through this, with, with this meeting and we have everybody's input and comments, uh, the bicycle facility alternatives will be presented to the Board of County Commissioners. Once we get a recommendation from the commissioners, we can begin our engineering design when after that we'll end up with a with a more complete plan set and uh, and we'll go back out to the public with an open house in the spring or summer of 2022 when that's behind us we will go into the right-of-way acquisition and permitting process for the project from there we move into final engineering design and then bid the project after the project's bid, we would hold a meet the contractor open house for the public and then hopefully start construction in the spring of 23 and wrap up in the fall of 2024. I'll switch to the other PowerPoint here. Can people see this or do I need to unshare? We've still got next steps on the screen. Okay, let's try this. Okay. There we go. We should have it now. Okay, this is roughly broken up and this isn't a, a strip map plan view that I've cut up to, to show the segments uh, with an aerial overlay. Uh, so the, the PCC acts, entrance is just off the map to the west here. And you can see the 10 foot shared use path coming down the north side up to the 173rd intersection. And then on the south side, we can see the sidewalk in gray, which is alternative one. And then the blue strip behind it is what the widening would look like if we went with alternate two, um, which would be, again, the, it's the 10 foot shared use path. So we're holding that 10 foot shared use path down, tying into an existing walk, and again, carrying the 10 foot down. But this at 173rd on the north side, we would drop the 10 foot shared use path at the 173rd intersection because there is a rapid uh, flashing beacon pedestrian crossing, which would move the 10 foot shared use path to the south. Which we can see here, we're carrying the 10 Alter, alternative one, a six foot sidewalk down the south side and the blue line behind it would be the additional four feet for a shared use path. And I also point out on this drawing, the, the red lines you can see here are the existing right of way as it stands today. 
none of these drawings account for any slopes or easements or right of way acquisition, acquisitions that would be needed to, to build this. On the north side, we're showing an eight foot walk coming down to the end of PCC. And here we are in segment three, which is the natural pinch point we drive through today. Again, a six foot walk in gray on the south side with a four foot additional in blue for a 10 foot shared use path. On the north side, we're showing the eight foot walk in gray and the purple or pink line to the north of it is a proposed wall location. And then as we come out of sand mill working to the east, we can see the sidewalk and the 10 foot shared use again on the south, six foot on the north. And you can see the, the left turn, center turn lane being reduced as we go across the culvert. And there, and there's a, a good view of it fully narrowed. Again, we're showing eight foot walk all the way on both sides across the culvert. And on the south side, we either utilize the existing sidewalk that's out there today, or we use a 10 foot shared use path up to 165th. And then on the north side, we're proposing using the existing five foot walk and tying into the Joss intersection. And the Joss 165th uh, Springville intersection is going to be getting a full traffic signal. That's kind of it for slides if people have questions. There's one in chat from Susan saying, can you define a shared use path? Uh, shared use path is, uh, is intended to be used by pedestrians, bicyclists, strollers, anything without a motor. All righty. Let's see. So are you, are you ready for questions, comments? Sure, yeah. Okay, all right. I see Jeannie, hopefully I'm saying that right, and then Jeff. Um, wait, before you do that, Andy, oh. could you put up segment, uh, what is it, three um, up on the uh, screen? Because I think most of the people um, who are participating are, are interested in that segment. Do we want the uh, cross sections or the... Uh, no? The, the 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 from the series you just did with the um, proposed okay. conditions and against the current conditions. Okay, we should be looking at it right now. Thanks. There you go. Yeah. All righty. Uh, Jeannie, you should be able to talk if you have a comment. Can you hear me? Okay, gotcha. so I have a couple, a few comments, but I just have a, I just wanted to start with a, a, just a general question that I raised before that I'm very confused about. So this is going to go to the commissioners as a bicycle facility alternative plan. And I'm very confused. They are going to approve the bicycle part of this, but not the street widening, or is this actually street widening in the guise of bicycle facility alternatives. I don't quite understand why they're getting just bicycle alternatives. And then this is gonna approve the whole um, project. If someone could just explain that to me. Well, the, the, the county has a transportation systems plan um, that Springville, for example, is an urban arterial, and uh, it there are design standards for it. it. It is called out in the in the 
Transportation System Plan, the TSP, is an urban arterial, which is, and it's either three or five lanes. And in this case, Springville is called out as a three lane. And that's two travel lanes and a left turn lane. Um, what would we be looking for from the board as a recommendation on what the, the bicycle and pedestrian treatments look like? That, that helps us set the footprint of the project. And then we figure out how to best fit it inside the existing conditions. Okay, so then what I hear you saying is that because it's an urban arterial designation, yes, it's, it's by default three lane as it is progressing right now. And so that doesn't need to be approved. Yes, that's correct. Um, That's correct. And Jeannie, this is Jeff Petrillo. Uh, the county originally had this designated as a five lane uh, widening project, and that was dating back about five years ago. And the community requested that that was uh, a highway going through our neighborhood, sort of a highway to nowhere, really. I mean, um, and asked through the TSP update, the Transportation System Plan update that was done in 2013, requested that this segment from the PCC Rock Creek entrance to Joss, as well as um, all the way to Kaiser, because uh, they would have all been five lanes, uh, be reduced to three lanes. Um, because the county needed, because of North Bethany development, the two lanes was no longer going to be um, adequate, um, no matter what the projections were. Um, and we were successful in having the plan updated uh, with that three lanes. Um, so that's why that's already on the books on the master plan. And that's why it doesn't require necessarily a further approval because it's already been adopted and approved four or five years ago. Right. I understand. I'm aware of that. Um, I guess I know that there's just some discussion about width of, um, you know, whether if there is room to discuss having a turn lane or no turn lane in certain sections, I guess this is the time to put emphasis on that if that's the way we'd like to see it happen or to have narrower sidewalks or not take out 15 trees, that type of thing. It sounds like this is the juncture uh, to advocate for those things. Okay, yeah, I mean, in, in this case, uh, the county standards for an urban arterial require a center turn lane in the TSP, it actually calls it out as a 14 foot center turn lane and and uh, all of the drawings we're looking at right now show it as a 13 foot. Uh, in the design process, we follow ODOT's uh, road design manual for uh, design and safety. Um, and that, and I, I went into that and looked at it with our traffic engineering department and uh, the average daily traffic out here is pretty much off the charts as far as requiring a center turn line, but we will certainly look at it further. Well, that's partly because we don't have other roadways that we should have in to handle the traffic out here. Like north of, north of Springville going over to 185th to redirect traffic. Things that were supposed to happen that haven't happened yet. But I understand. Thank you. Sure. I think I'm next. Um, uh, Annie, the could you the timeline you put up, or I'm sorry, the tasks you put up, the yeah. you know, that are, will occur. The um, what's the timeline on those? I think the first one was presentation to board on bicycle facilities. Is that January, December, February? Uh, I'm I'm hoping for January. Right. And then the next one, I think, was, I know I can't recall. Oh, uh, pre, uh, engineering. Um, so, yeah, once once we move. When I have some some recommendation from the board there, we we go back with the design team and then we would move towards a 30 percent design. And that would happen then February, presumably, or, or late January, February. Yeah, I think we could have. I think we could have something in February, 
at I'd say let's say end of February. And then that 30% design would go to um, a public meeting format or a Zoom format. Uh, for, that's what we're doing. Um, yeah. Or in the early spring. Yep. Is it, so that's about the timeline before you move toward um, finalizing and bidding later in the year. Well, it, it would go through several different design phases. We the thirty the thirty percent is where we would start identifying areas where we either needed with right away where we needed slopes or a wall, and we'd start looking at okay the elevations more and, and starting on the permitting process as well. It, I think that's helpful for people like um, well, there's two major parties right there on the on the where the road narrows, Nalties yes. and Genopolis. Um, yep. And I think, and then there's the, the communities that are uh, Samuel and others on both sides of the road that um, I think it's a, just, that's a helpful context for them to know when there will be opportunities, for instance, talked about trees or or different uh, dimensions of the, of the plan. Um, yep. So I, I'll, I'm done with my comments and open it up to others, so. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a few, to, few from chat I'd like to go through here uh kind of wrap it here so let's see we got after after the shared use we've got jody with uh so you will not need to acquire any land it sounds like that in the time frame yeah, no. you're up. <laughs> there there would be uh for sure one point where on the north side where we would need to acquire property okay uh there's Jake has a, um, you know, why, why both if we have a bike lane? I, I think that might be in reference to the shared use path. Is that, maybe Jake can type here as well, but. We are, as far as, from my understanding, we are required to have a bike lane on both sides of the road. Okay. Which, which ties, complete which, streets. Yeah, it, and it ties into uh, the, the bike lanes on the segments that are already completed on either side of this this phase. Okay, and this is on this is on the Samuel section too. So let's see, Dave Snyder has. Will there be retaining walls on the south side of near Samuel? It's too soon to tell, but I right in front of Samuel, it would be. I would say it's unlikely. Um, as you move out across the culvert itself because the road will get wider there, it would need, it would likely need a, a retaining wall on the south side. It would be shorter than the one you're seeing on the north side, um, more mid slope. Uh, that's, that's healthier for the environment than running the slope out farther into the, the green space and wetland. Okay. Uh, next, Jody's got wire turning lanes consistently wider than driving lanes. Well, they're actually striped. They're striped with a buffer on the, if a good example would be uh, at the Joss intersection now, uh, westbound, that left turn pocket, the, the double yellows right there are actually 20 inches apart, center to center. So your, your active lane width really isn't smaller than a travel lane. Okay. It's the striping. And then Tanya says she has a, a few questions. So I just have um, uh, unmuted you, Tanya, you're up. Awesome, thank you. So you mentioned that there would be, so along the stretch from 173rd to 165th, so there's a rapid uh, pedestrian beacon there. And then, then yep. there would be a proposed light at Joss and 165th. Correct. Wondering if there would be anything in the way of speed uh, speed control between that period or section, particularly around the Samuel Drive, just because there's a blind curve around that area. So if someone were to connect from the Samuel you know, neighborhood or that way into the PCC Rock Creek area, um, if there's anything in the way of controlling that speed area, because again, it is a, a blind, a blind curve. Yeah. So the, the roads of, of the speed on it was recently dropped to 40 miles an hour. And the, so that that's the design speed we're working with. So 
an example like coming out of Samuel, uh, will that will be designed for the proper site distance for a 40 mile an hour road. So I guess what, I'm, what that means is that the hump could get cut down or Samuel could, could be built up slightly or a combination of both. And, you know, this, the site distance will be correct. Um, you know, I hide at three and a half feet and 15 feet back from the stop bar, all of it, uh, all that engineering goes into the design. Okay. So no, but no thought as to maybe a, a, a yellow caution light right out that intersection, especially since, you know, bus stops are stopping there also. Um, sure. But, but that's a, again, the, the blind, the blind curve is the piece that concerns me, especially with kids and dogs and making the connection to get to PCC uh, plus the dog park. So just, just a consideration there. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will, uh, I'll talk to the design team about it. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. Back to the, back to the raised hand. So Mary, I saw you pop up after Jeff there, and then we'll go to the attendee list here and then back to questions. What's the game, what's the game plan? Mary. Uh, so real quick, Andy, can you speak to design exceptions? You've talked about what the, what the engineering requirements are, but I know like with Bethany Boulevard, there were design exceptions allowed five lane road and the center turn lane is there part of the way and not part of the way, part of it is a planter, planter strip as opposed to a center turn lane. Um, can you talk to the process for design exceptions being, being considered? Yeah, well, the lane widths, for example, the the TSP would call for a 14 foot center turn lane and 12 foot travel lanes. And uh, the a design exception would be to narrow that up as I have shown in, in the alternatives to 11 and a half foot travel lanes and 13 foot center lane. Uh, that would require a design exception to showing that it's it, that it's a safe option and then the county engineer would ultimately have to sign the design exception but if the community would like to request additional design exceptions um you know do we have to come with lighted torches and pitchforks or oh, no. what, what 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 would it take to um get the county to consider options I I would ask you to start with me, um, emailing me or calling me, and and uh, and we can certainly take a look at some of the requests. All right. Okay, back to back to raised hands. Uh, we've got I think Larry and then Jeannie, Susan. I need to allow Larry to talk. There we go. Larry, you're up. Can you hear me now? Uh, there we go. Yep. Okay. Um, currently, coming out of Samuel Drive and that, there's a there's a bus stop on the south side as well as a bus stop on the north side. Would it be possible to have a lighted uh, crossing installed across that section? Just I, one. Because people just move from one side of the road to the other. Another rapid flashing beacon. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, there, this is something I can I can uh, I can talk to our traffic engineering group about and get back to you. Okay. The other thing coming out of Samuel Drive and that I see where we have heading towards 185th, there appears to be uh, an arrow in the center lane turning into Samuel Drive. Coming out of Samuel Drive, would we also be able to make a left turn heading towards 185th? Yeah, and use that as a refuge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, when you're the, where you see the left turn arrow, that's a designated left. Uh, to, to the west of Samuel, that would be like a median. 
uh, it'll be it'd be a solid with solid yellow with yellow skips on the inside. So there there would be arrows pointing both directions in that. Perfect. That thank, thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. I've got Susan with a hand up, and Larry, we just got to you, and then we'll go back to chat. And do rapid fire until about five till. Susan. Okay. Um, just a couple things to the folks down there on Samuel Drive. As the person who stands to lose the most <laughs> with that center lane, I, as a part of the design, um, I I can totally sympathize that they would want that because the site that sits there is crappy, which is why we retired our driveway access onto Springdale Road because it was too dangerous um, to make left-hand turns, even right-hand turns out of our driveway. And then that said, I have a question about um, the design speed, which was set by ODOT at 40 miles per hour. Right. I, yeah, so as I was driving around today, coming up Brookwood Drive south of Maine, which is going through uh, a residential neighborhood area, it's three lane with sidewalks and bike lanes on both sides. The speed limit there is 35. Um, so I, I don't understand you know, that seems kind of arbitrary because I was told that um, the width of the road at, at this curve and hill was dependent on, you know, what speed limit ODOT set. So why, why is it set at 35 for some neighborhoods and not for other neighborhoods? Because we have a lot, because of the uh, THPRD recreation area, we have a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists and, you know, parents with strollers um, on the road. Now, now having a sidewalk on the south side, as well as the north side, will certainly make it safer for, say, people that are coming uh, through Samuel Drive, through the cul-de-sac, because there's a walkway that goes over the bridge. Now they will have the option of coming up a sidewalk on the south side um, instead of crossing there at Samuel Drive, which I myself do all the time, and it's quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, I never walk across. I always run across. Um, so I, the idea of a blinking light there, that's attractive, but, but there will be a change in the traffic pattern in the sense that there will be a signaled light at Joss and then there will be sidewalks on both sides of the road. Just just pointing that out um, to, to everybody that's here this evening. Um, I, of course, am advocating for the narrowest option because I really, truly, deeply mourn the loss of mature trees on the south side of my property because uh, we have a wind tunnel effect. We get the winds from the gorge coming up the road, the ever widening road. And um, I, you know, I will lose my wind buffer and a good deal of canopy cover. And um, this past summer with the extreme drought and heat dome um, emphasizes that canopy cover is so important. And so I would plead with the designers to think about that. Um, as you look at the varying options. I know it's only a foot or two, you know, for the sidewalk or a foot or two for the center lane, for the bike lanes, but it all adds up. And the net effect is um, a significant loss. So I, I think that that's a concept that should be addressed, not just for my property, not just my NIMBY issue, but it should be addressed when looking at road um, improvements throughout the county. And I will finish <laughs> saying my say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I see two, let's see, order-wise, Beth, I see you had a question in chat. So I'm gonna unmute you. You're welcome to speak or we can read your question. And then Perry and Kristen, I think you were next up. So I can read your question next. Beth? Yeah, um, I just want to follow on Larry's suggestion of the uh, traffic um, pedestrian crossing. Um, because we are connected to the, 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 the park trail. Oh, I got your computer. There, can you hear me? 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, There are are a lot of people that come into our neighborhood and they cross the street right at Samuel Drive to access um, the, the trail. Um, going into the to, to the next neighborhood. Well, Samuel's part of the trail system. Yeah. Yes, Samuel's part of the trail system. So, um, so uh, it is extremely dan- dangerous, and I am one of those people that run across that street as well. And because there's so many families with kids with bikes that come through this neighborhood um, to access the trails, something has to be um, allowed for in this for some sort of safe crossing. I, I, will, uh, I will definitely work with the design team and bring, bring this you. to their attention. And the other question I had was uh, earlier, you said that um, it's estimated that over 10,000 vehicles are gonna be coming along this road by 2035, I think. Yep. Was that taking into consideration the opening of Shackleford Road to 185th, or is that without any um, opening? As far as I know, it doesn't. Um, I can I can find out and get back to you if you'd like. And, and I don't know, you know, I don't know in, in government how these things work, but boy, it certainly would be great to have another access point to take some of the traffic strain off of uh, Springville Road. Yeah, hey, and uh, that, yeah. go ahead. Uh, Andy, it's Joe, yep. uh, Joe Yonkins. And um, sorry about that, I, I've just been listening in. Um, I just wanted to add on to what Andy said, about, um, Beth, you asked the question about Shackleford. And usually when a traffic study is done, it looks, when it looks out to 2035, it would be looking at all of the planned uh, build out and planned facilities in the area. But um, we'll double check um, with the traffic engineers on this one, but I think it does include Shackleford and it accounts for the full build out of North Bethany and also the full build out actually for everything um, on the east side of, Saltzman and everywhere else that's bringing traffic either east-west towards PCC or when it leaves PCC or the traffic that wants to run east-west and not drop down to West Union until they get to 185th and they cut over towards uh, from 185th up to Germantown then and over to Cornelius Pass. So all of that traffic is looked at. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe, this is Jeff Petrillo. I, I don't believe um, 20 uh, because the Shackleford ex- expansion area is still um, outside um, the urban growth boundary. I don't believe it's probably included in the that study. Also, looking at the 2025, there's no funding or approval to even act on it. So I'd be I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical that it includes that that number. Yeah, and we'll look at that, Jeff. Uh, as I'm saying, I mean, you're going right now, you're going out to 2035, which is well beyond any funding program that is out there. I mean, when you start talking 15 years out. Um, but like we said, we'll take a look at it and see what we come up with. And the other uh, one, I think, uh, Beth, maybe you asked um, what our hope is um, by building uh, one, the bike lane, number two, either a shared use path or uh, sidewalks on the south side also, that folks who do want to go to PCC will walk the south side up to the mid-block crossing and then cross over to PCC. It uh, has great sight distance. Uh, it's on a straightaway. Um, it's uh, a great opportunity. There's a, a, then if you pick up on the shared use path on the north side and a direct um, access up in the PCC. So that would be our hope for people who are on the south side. To cross ago. at that mid block crossing. And, 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 and the elevation is going to be reduced um, somewhat at the uh, peak of or at the um, the rise in the street there. Is that correct? Is it going to be? And did you want to answer that? I believe that our, we would be looking at um, reducing the vertical curve that would increase sight distance for folks who are coming out of um, Samuel. Yeah. Yeah, that that hill would it it could be a combination of of reducing that hill and and possibly raising Samuel slightly, but we need we need to get the motorist up where they can see, and and 
I'm pretty certain it's uh, it'd be 400 feet is the visibility they'd need for sight distance. Yeah, that, that would be great until uh, the sidewalks can be implemented because as I mentioned, it is a pretty blind curve when you're crossing just right now as is mm -hmm. the risk for sure. sure. Um, Andrew, I think there's a person who hasn't spoke, uh, Jake Barone. Yeah, I promised, let's see, Barry and Kristen, and then maybe Jake. Um, uh, Barry and Kristen, are you still around? Do you want to speak or I can read your question? There we are. You're live if you can speak. Okay. Just want to know about the south driveways um, of our property in section one. Yeah, it was again, okay. section mm -hmm. one, and then will the, I think the question was right, will the driveways on the south side of section one be preserved? Yes. Right. Yes, all the, all the driveway access points would be maintained. That's the question, okay. Okay, uh, Jake, you can speak. There we go, so sorry. It's actually Heather, uh, can we oh. go back to phase two by chance, which would be slide three. Okay, quick question. So the south side of this, where we see the green line, do you know what the measurements are gonna be for the sidewalk and how much more you'll be taking into that? And then I also wanted to discuss um, sound pollution and light pollution from the road. I know we've discussed speed limit uh, quite a bit but something to think about is that retaining wall. It was discussed briefly, and I know, Andy, you might've said that that was potentially a no, but then maybe discussing lowering the speed limit as at two o'clock in the morning, I'm really awakened by a lot of traffic. And I can't imagine what that's gonna look like if we're increasing the traffic on this road, uh, cause our house backs the, our fence actually backs the road. So I just wanna make sure we know how much is coming in on us if we're losing our trees, as that also has been discussed, uh, the heat waves that we've been receiving the last few years due to uh, climate change, it's gonna just increase. So I'm just curious on if those trees are gonna be removed, cut back, what that might look like, and then how much is coming in, and then the new street lamps that could potentially be going in and designed for those. Okay, well, let's start with the, the green strip. Uh, that would be the planter area that we're looking at, the four-foot planter. And then the gray is the six-foot six walk behind it uh, from alternative one. And then the blue would be the additional four feet for a shared-use path shown in alternative two. So uh, the gray is what's already there? No, this is the proposed... This is what the proposed... Uh, footprint looks like gotcha. there's no sidewalk there now yeah there's some intermittent stuff uh, scattered along in there but yeah as far as trees go uh you know we're we will do what we can to save in to save trees um whether that means a wall and or or having an arborist we will have an arborist come out and look at trees and if, if, a, if a tree can be saved reasonably we will definitely make that an effort to do that. Uh, the county standards do require us uh, to put trees back in in these planter areas and then there's there's a with the permitting at the culverts uh, there's a lot of regulatory agencies in there that will require plantings as well. And we, we'll always look for opportunities to, to plant more trees where we've got real estate to do it. Uh, you asked about illumination, the lighting out there. Uh, the standard for North Bethany in the land use is the, is the black, um, it's the black Westbrook light, which is the shepherd hook style that you see out on the phases on either side of this. And primarily that's the light you would see except for at an intersection, you could see a cobra head or something different on top of a 
of the signal at Joss. But yeah, Black Westbrook style. Um, I've already thought about uh, light pollution back in the, the properties. And I can tell you all the lighting that the county installs now is all dark sky compliant. Um, in addition, where we where the roadway backs up to a home, we we will shield the lights. Yeah. It it's different than the shielding that you you saw on the older style lights. You won't really be able to see them. They're actually in the in the lamp portion on the LED lights. Gotcha. I've seen a few of them. Yeah. So we'll we'll definitely that will definitely be handled in the in the project design. And then as far as the noise walls go, uh, sound walls, um, we have not considered it yet at this point in the design for the project. I can tell you though that the, the county's noise po uh, policy does not require, does not require uh, sound walls in a, a situation, situation like this. Um, the TSP, it has shown this road as a, a three lane or five lane. It, let's say it, it, the TSP had it a three lane for, and then changed it to a five lane road, that would trigger us to look at noise walls closer. I, I will, we do have a, a, a sound noise expert, uh, Mike Meyer, that the county works with quite a bit, and I will have him come out to the project and and uh, do an analysis. Is there? Thanks for that. Um, so, kind of just on that point uh, that you mentioned that going from a three to a five lane, is there a possibility though that with the arborist and the trees were to have to be removed, that then that would be considering a change in like a sound barrier or something like that since that would be our backyard kind of thing uh i i, I you know i really don't know the answer to that i i would tell you probably not on a tree where it's not a permanent considered i don't know i i i will find out that sounds like sounds like you're yeah planning to include a, a noise analysis yeah. in there as well yeah. that, that's okay that's good awesome thank you yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, last, I know <laughs> game plan went slightly over, but uh, before we break, uh, Commissioner Trees, did you want to comment or uh, make anything, make a make a statement here? Well, I'm I'm concerned. First of all, oh, thank you, but I think we need to. Did we hear from Jeannie? Her hand is still up. We did, but I, I don't know. Let's see, Jeannie, did you have a question? I, I had a further comment, if you okay. don't mind. Uh, I've been waiting. Sure. I, I just, and it it dovetails on what a few other people have said. Um, I just, I really want to emphasize that I, I feel that I, I recognize the county has standards, but I think when we're looking at two or three feet, making the difference of taking down 14 mature dug firs, just, that's just along our property. And it sounds like some of our neighbors have similar concerns that those, the weight of the impact of the removal of those trees should be heavily weighted in the design exemption possibilities of this plan. Those trees, many of them are 75 years old and older, probably older, hundred years old. They provide a wind and wind shield, canopy, noise shield, and and also, um, well, yeah, basically the noise shield is what I was trying to say. And if, if you remove those automatically, our sound levels are gonna go up just by removing those trees. And the impact, um, the visual impact is gonna be stunning to our property and to all the people in, in Graff Meadows as well. So I just wanted to emphasize, I'd like to see some more um, weight put into, I, I understand, I hear Andy saying they won't remove a tree if they don't have to, but you know, if your plan says that it comes one foot into my dug fur or six inches and you could have just 
rather than a 10 foot multi-use path, you could have put in a six foot or five foot bike path or sidewalk and not taken that tree down. I think that that's a kind of thing that should be overlaid in this design process before we go out and say, okay, we have a 10 foot multi-use path here. This dug fur has to come down. Instead, I'd like to see it. Oh, we have 14 mature dug furs here. Let's try to keep those and only have a five foot by a uh, sidewalk, which we have on much of Springville, which would be perfectly adequate. So I just wanted to say, put that out there. And then also, I, my, I had a question in chat earlier, and it's kind of just a statement or query. Why do we need a multi-use path if we have bike lanes on both the north and south sides of the road? And also, we also have a park path that is multi-use for much of the north side. So I just, that's all I wanted to emphasize at this point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, th thank you. And Jeannie, thank I'm glad we got your comments out there. Uh, this is something that is uh, certainly uh, a, a project that needs uh, community input. And I'm really pleased that uh, the CPO uh, put this to the forefront. I've, I've been listening. I've been in tune with what was, what's happening. Um, I've Joe Yonkin, Stephen Roberts. I haven't had a chance to talk to Andy previously about this, but we were in conversation uh, when it was going to, when it was going to be on the work session previously. And I, I I really appreciate the fact that the staff has been flexible in extending the time frame so that we can get the public comment that's that's necessary here. So you know, I won't go on about this. I just want you to know that I, I appreciate what the staff's doing to try to uh, make sure we're listening to everybody and see what all of our possibilities are. And I appreciate the public coming forward and talking about what your concerns are. So thank you. And Andrew, I appreciate going over you know, a few minutes, but I do think it was worthwhile. So I won't say any more. Thanks. And I hope everybody has a, a pleasant holiday season. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank, thanks for your comments, Commissioner. And thank you all for your time today. Um, we do have one more item of business, but I'll, I'll go ahead and... Well, I just want to also thank Andy. I know he's new uh, to the county uh, in this role and uh, um, good job. We appreciate your, your yeah, help thanks for that, coming. as well as Joe's. So, and, 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 and the Commissioner for being here. So, yeah, Everybody's free to reach out to me whenever I'm available. You just send us your cell phone number. That'd be great. <laughs> you <can> do that. <laughs> did you did you put your like? I, let's see. I plugged my email in, and you okay, can that'll be you can find me on WC Roads too. So yeah, all emails should be good. So. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that, that's perfect. If that's in chat, that would be awesome. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. So appreciate it. Uh, we, uh, Mary, we do have one more item of business, which is approving some tweaks and modifications to a letter we sent earlier. So if you would like to stick around and vote or-, no. or yep, And actually those, one then... of the things I'd like people to know is that we reached, reached out to um, one, Paul, one, one Carlos, um, the uh, uh, Metro Councilor. One Carlos yeah. Gonzalez. Yes, Juan Carlos Gonzalez, the Metro Councilor, and have invited him to our January meeting to talk about barriers to bringing in that last piece of, of land into the urban growth boundary in the next um, uh, urban growth boundary expansion. There are barriers to it, but um, we have invited him. He has accepted our invitation. So if you have strong opinions about getting Shackleford Road built, um, you might wanna show up for our January meeting as well. So the last item of business is we um, approved the letter for the Salzman Road improvements back in uh, September. And it was brought to our attention there were a couple of clarifications that we needed to make. And so we drafted the letter and it says, please accept the following corrections, clarifications to our letter dated September 14th 2021 in support of the Salzman Road Western alignment. From the first page under cost is no objection, the fourth bullet point should read, due to these safety concerns, the community worked tirelessly to achieve 6.5 million 
funding for the improvements to Salzman with many of these community members supporting the Western linemen. Uh, second issue is from the second no, page he, under he visible issue. The second bullet point should be CPO7 and CPO1 have routinely hosted packed sessions on Salzman Road. Some community members have expressed a willingness to embrace added alternative fundraising and additional tax burden to fund the right long-term solution. With these clarifications, our community membership continues to support construction of the Western alignment on Salzman Road. So I move that we um, adopt these, these uh, clarifications and um, send them on to the commissioners as soon as possible. And, and I'll second that. Uh, it was great to have the community come forward with some of the documentation from years ago. So I appreciate being able to correct the, the, the statements here. So second. So now becomes the difficult process. Well, any discussion, but the difficult process becomes the vote. Um, <laughs> right. Because yeah. we, we need to figure out who is a member, who, who, who can vote, who can't. And essentially, if you live within the boundaries of CPO7, you own property within our boundaries, or you um, own a business within our boundaries, you are qualified to vote. So I know like even Joe Youngkins is, is um, eligible to vote. He is a county um, employee, but um, he does live in CPO7. Um, but I guess um, any discussion, raise your hand if you, if you have questions. Well, I like this idea of using CPO. Not for me. I get I, I I get these emails every month. Well, I'm not I'm not seeing a conversation going on. I thought somebody had some comments. Pam, are you raising your hand? Well, I was just going to say I think Barry and Kristen might need to mute their um their uh uh computer. I muted them. I, I muted them. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Well, let's let's rock on to the vote then. If no okay. discussion. Great. Um, let's see if we can figure it out. Um, so what did we do last time? Like we need to count the number of checked, members. Right? Yeah. And I guess. Well, Mary, um, can't we just have people raise their hand if they're voting one way or the other? Yeah. Okay. You know, that that would voting work. Yes, and then you can count them. Okay, that would work. Did everybody hear that? If you are eligible to vote, please raise your hand. It's if, not if yay, you're voting, yay. If you're voting whatever. in favor of it, yes. If your vote is yes, raise your hand. Oh. Isn't that the way to do it? Yeah, yeah, that will work. <laughs> we, we did another variation last time, but this will work. <laughs> yeah, so I'm seeing nine people with hands raised. I think Beth Estock should raise her hand. I did raise my hand. Oh, okay. There's ten. It wasn't it wasn't there initially. So I'm seeing is that there's ten. Okay. Ten. Yeah. Okay. And we have a total of 18 participants, but I guess we don't need to worry about that. So we have 10 people raising their hand. And in, so in favor, right. No, if you're oh. in favor, raise your hand now. Ten again. Ten again. Okay, great. Yeah. Right I here. think you can skip that step. Um, and then voting no. Yeah, we're down. Uh, we got two voting no. Mary's voting no, and Wait. Susan Nolte. Well, right. no, I'm not voting no. Susan Nolte, are you voting no? No. There we go. There we go. So all it's right. like unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Perfect. All right. With that, I think that takes us home. I appreciate everyone's time. Have a wonderful evening. And we'll I, talk to I you just want to say that voting on Zoom is very, very hard. So I appreciate the, the <laughs> We're trying. We're trying, Commissioner. <laughs> it's hard for everybody every single time. So please, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's great to see everybody. Thank so, you for coming. Got Pam, can we see you? Can we see you in January, possibly, for a discussion about? Um, um, I haven't looked at my calendar yet, but okay. uh, you know, I, I'd like to be here. You will see me on Thursday night. Yes. 
yes. for the Salzman Road Advisory Committee meeting. So, so I'll be there for sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you, Brenda. With that, we'll roll into our steering committee meeting. You're welcome to stay. I will be promoting everybody to participate. I'll let you. I'll let you go. Uh, and Mary, thank you for your input for the discussion tomorrow on the CPOs. Okay. Looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> See you all soon. Take care. All right. Bye all. And I am going.